Welcome to Soul Blazing. I'm Lisa Haysha. My guest today is a former music exec for Motown and many of the top artists in the world. Welcome, Carrie Gordy. Good to see you again. Oh, it's so great to see you. Yeah. So, so God, Motown, there's so many stories, so many things I want to touch on. I'll just touch on them all. Yes. Which I, but I have to say, um, you finally brought the soul into the blazing. Oh, <laughs> okay. thank you. Yeah. Anyway. yeah. So tell me about Motown, the history of Motown. Your father created Motown. It began as a family, and and my father was a uh, he was a he was a, a songwriter originally. But what he wanted to do is 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 create something that was more like a. Um, like a Ford assembly line where uh, an artist could come in, you know, kind of all raggedy, and then he could put his artist development and his songwriters and his producers and all of these things together. And when they would come in, they would be raggedy, but when they would go out, they would be a shiny new car, you know? Right, <laughs> yes, yes. He, he was actually, at one point, he was, a, um, he was on the assembly line working for Ford, and that's where he got the idea, well, if, if they can do this with cars, maybe I could do this with artists. He's always been a, a songwriter writer and so uh, initially he started with the passion of music and uh, and then as he started uh, finding artists and finding talent uh, like Smokey Robinson and Marvin Gaye and Stevie Wonder and Dinah Ross. Yes you know. and in case you guys don't know his father is Barry Gordy. Barry Gordy, yeah. Barry Gordy yes. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yes. Right? So what was it like living at that time as a kid growing up with all these superstars around you? You were like a royal family. Well, I was, Motown was a kingdom and it was perhaps the only black kingdom in America at the time. So growing up Motown, I was a prince yes. and, and, and everybody looked up to the people that were our subjects. Yes. Say so. Our subjects were Diana Ross, Stevie Wonder, Michael Jackson, Lionel Richie, Rick James, Ooh, The Four yeah. Tops, The Temptations, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And and so those people looked up to our family when all of the people in the streets uh, and normal people out there looked up to them. Yeah. So my life has been kind of an embarrassment of riches and fun and just it's been the most amazing life anybody could ever imagine having. So tell me a juicy story, something that we don't know, you know, that about Michael Jackson and or any of your guests. Well, okay. Well, first of all, I have a thousand stories about everybody. Mm -hmm. um, a juicy story about Michael Jackson. Um, Did his father really abuse him? Well, okay, put it this way. Michael Michael, um, his father was a strict disciplinarian and they had to rehearse when they had to rehearse and if they got things wrong, they might, uh, they might be at the end of a, you know, a slap on the back of the head or something, right? So uh, the fact of the matter is, is that he created a level of excellence in his family where they had to do stuff right, they had to rehearse. And I, I used to be scared of Joe when I was a child because I always felt that there was a potential that uh, I could be assaulted, right? right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, he always respected me. That never happened. And, and I used to think, oh, that's rough for, you know, the Jacksons to be living under this type of thing until, until I managed Rick James. Okay. okay. When I managed Rick James and he would be stoned and I couldn't get him in the car to get to the interview or to get to the place, I said, gosh, I wish I could just spank his butt. <laughs> and then I said, well, maybe Joe wasn't so bad. Right, right? you understood. <laughs> right. you had I, I, under I totally understood. But yeah. What about your father, though? Wasn't Barry Gordy also strict? Well, strict, yeah. Well, see, he was the head of the family. He was a king. Mm -hmm. And... Um, a king uh, has to make decisions based on what's in front of him. And sometimes the decisions are, no, you can't do that. No, that doesn't fall within the budget. No, that doesn't meet the timeline. And sometimes it's yes. Uh, but competition 
thoroughbred champions uh, in the Motown scenario. You had all of these great writers, you know, Smokey Robinson, Norman Whitfield, who wrote I Heard It Through the Grapevine and Ain't Too Proud to Beg, and, uh, you know, just, uh, and, and everybody was competing to get their songs on the different acts, where it, whether it was Mary Wells or the Supremes or, or any of the Four Tops, everybody was competing to get their songs. So it was like um, uh, the fittest would win out and uh, and the songs that were the best would win out so he had to be and and, and by the way uh, his his the base basically he would say okay uh if he heard a song that wasn't that he didn't think it go to number one he would say okay that's garbage and a lot of people would be hurt by that but in reality he wasn't saying it was garbage he was just saying it wasn't up to the standard of motown mm. he was rough he was rough but he was great yes. he was great and he was rough at the same time i heard that he only hired white execs is that true okay first of all that's not true okay but wait a minute <laughs> i mean but in the beginning in the beginning uh, when he was putting together his company, we're we're in the we're in the '60s, you know. Uh, civil rights, uh, you know, legislation hadn't been passed, and and the fact of the matter is, is he needed to sell his records uh, all over the United States. He needed to sell his records in the South. He needed to sell his records in the North, and he didn't want to have a uh, a black person going to the 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 south to try to get into the uh the rag jobbers and the stores and and um the 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 merchandisers down there and the he it was it would it would have been it would have been wrong because he didn't know who was a uh, uh, you know hiding behind a Ku Klux Klan mask he didn't know who was prejudiced and he didn't want politics in his business so he said no I am not gonna hire black sales executives in the beginning because I'm a businessman and I have to do what's pragmatic for the business. So, yes, he, and, you know, yes, and basically um, <laughs> uh, Italians, basically, he picked <laughs> to promote his records. <laughs> that way, you know, nobody messed with us, right? <laughs> right? And, of course, uh, there is that wait, rumor, wait, too. Wait, wait, yeah. There's that rumor, too. Yes. That's that rumor, too. Yes. And, by yes. the way, that's how that rumor came. We were never in the mafia, but uh, <laughs> don't say anything, right? Right, right. <laughs> I mean, if you don't want right, to end exactly. up, you know, with, uh, you know. We're not with, involved, but. Yeah, yeah. But, if but, you don't but. want to end up in cement shoes just don't say anything yeah uh, but um, no yeah and 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 for instance you know his money he it just see I don't know if he did this on purpose but it seems like most of the people that handled his money and his accounts they, it seemed like they were Jewish and it seemed like his uh, his his promotion people were Italian <laughs> and it seemed like uh, his sales people were basically white because that's the way that that's how he needed to do it in order in that time frame to, to, to be successful. It changed so much during that period, the 60s and the 70s. How did Motown shift with the changes in the political climate? With regard to, um, to Motown shifting uh, to the times, yes, the 60s were, uh, it, the 60s, it was a tumultuous time for the United States. So, uh, you know, we went from this nice company that was doing, we were doing l love songs, you know. I hear, whenever you're near, I hear a symphony. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 do you love me? I can really move. Uh, uh, I was made to love her. It, they were all, you know, love songs and fun songs, but uh, we were very clear on not wanting to be political and not wanting to um, to be this company that people would say, oh, this black company is doing this and blah blah blah. So we were we were very um, cognizant of the type of material that we would put into the market. But as the times changed and the Vietnam War and the president being shot and Martin Luther King being assassinated and all of this kind of stuff, then. Uh, we changed with the times. So therefore we would put out war. Huh, what is it good for? <laughs> Absolutely nothing, right? <laughs> nothing, right? And then we would do songs. We, we would do songs like, 
uh, What's Going On. Marvin Gaye did, yeah. you know, which is one of the great albums of, of, of all time, you know. He's asking what's going on. And then you had Stevie uh, doing all of these now political songs, you know. You Haven't Done Nothing, which was, you know, basically talking about the, the president at the time, you know. And then you had Stevie Wonder, you know, mm -hmm. focused on how, how, you know, how can he help the world? You know, he got behind the Martin Luther King holiday and um, really did everything he could to get the visibility up and toured and, and did all of this thing to galvanize the, 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 the public into, yes, this guy needs a holiday because he was a good-hearted person. He believed in, you know, uh, uh, goodness and, and, and truth and, you know, not, not the Vietnam War, all of that kind of stuff. So, yes, we changed with the time uh, because the times change. Yes, of course. I want to know, how did that change you, growing up in all this? Well, first of all, it, I, have a, I have a really interesting perspective because the people that the world looked up to, I knew them intimately. So when, say, David Ruffin from The Temptations would, uh, you know, be on a, a horrible drug binge and I would see that people on the outside, oh, I wish I could be like David Ruffin or I wish I could be like this person. And I would just sit back and say, oh my gosh, just because he's got money and fame, he's got a lifestyle that is just, it's, 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 it's horrendous. And the fact of the matter is, is that I then looked at life from a different perspective. And my life, and it, then it became money is not the thing, fame is not the thing, the thing is life, happiness, um, uh, being able people to live. People need to hear that. It's not all about money and people, fame. I mean, yeah. that is very important. People need to live day to day in, uh, in a place where uh, they're able to be happy uh, within themselves. And, and I also found this out. If you're happy when you're broke and you're a good person yes. when you're broke, yes. you're going to be a good person and happy when you're rich. And Absolutely. you're going to be able to do good things for good people. Now, if you're, a, if, you're, if you're sad or if you're a drug addict or if you're crazy, when you're rich, it's going it's, it, it's gonna, it's gonna to be exponential because now you have the resources yep. to buy more drugs. You have the resources to be more of a jerk. You have more fans. Right? You have people coming That's at you, right. throwing and themselves then you at have, you. Then you have those sycophants and those obsequious people uh, kissing your butt and telling you everything that you want to hear, uh, that they want to hear, and they get totally out of perspective, and then they start eliminating the people in their lives who are actually telling them the truth. Um, and I submit, um, I, I ran Prince's company, I was very good friends with Michael Jackson. If those two people had stayed in our presence, they would still be living today because, <laughs> because they got to a point they got to a point where all of the enablers just come in and their job is to keep a job and to extract as much money from those people as possible. That's their job. Yes, absolutely. Right? Let but, me switch gears a little and ask you this. What was it like growing up under Barry Gordy? Like, what's your relationship with him, your mom, and all the siblings? There's so many of you. Did they try to push you in the business? Did they try to keep you out of it? Are your siblings half in, half not? What's the dynamic? Well. Um, we had, okay, we had the ability to see everything uh, from a, a, a very <laughs> direct place. So therefore we got to see what the work ethic was like. We got to see my father spending hours and hours and days and days in the studio. We, had to, we got to see him having to maneuver between mm -hmm. Diana Ross and Michael Jackson and then going into the movies with Billy Dee Williams and, and Richard Pryor and all of the people that he was responsible for and how he had to deal with it. We got to understand the work ethic. We also had the advantage of having a company that we could go into. I went in and I started in the mailroom and to go through all of the divisions and see what everybody does and and see how a company is really uh, how you how a company really has to deal 
in order to be successful. So yes, uh, we got to see so much more than a normal person gets to see. Right. So, um, but we also got to see that hard decisions have to be made. And so um, a lot of times hard decisions were made. And then we got to see, you know, sometimes no matter what you do, no matter how great you are, things just don't work. And you have to be able to push through and fight through all of that, yeah. right? Um, and, and the key is not giving up. I mean, the difference between today and, um, and, and, and how it was back then, if my father believed in something, if he believed in, for instance, Stevie Wonder. Stevie Wonder goes four or five years without a hit between fingertips and I was made to love her. And everybody was telling my father, get rid of that kid. He's a kid. He's, you know, he's a liability. He's this and that. My father's like, listen, I'll never get rid of that kid because if he doesn't get a hit, it's not his fault. It's our fault. So our, our, we, we, our, um, our marketing was incorrect. Our public relations was incorrect. Our A&R, the, the way that we created the music for that individual was incorrect. But he's a genius and we are not gonna, I will never drop Stevie in a million years, ever, wow. right? And so that same kind of thing happened with Diana. Diana and the Supremes, they went five or six records without a hit. And everybody was calling them the no-hit Supremes, get rid of those bums. And he said, no, that girl in the front with the big eyes. Yes. <laughs> and by the way. They slept her, together. Oh, uh, 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 did they? <laughs> but wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm not saying that they slept <laughs> together. I'm just saying that I have a sister. <laughs> okay. Okay. That, Somehow happened. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, yes. I don't know. I, I don't know how that happened, yeah. but it may have yeah. been. You know. The, you know. Come on, Joseph, Jesus. Yes. I mean, yes. it, it could have happened like that. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I don't know how it happened. Absolutely. But anyway, <laughs> but they were close. They, they were really yeah, close. close. Yes. They were really close. I don't know how my mother liked it yeah <laughs> <laughs> but what about your siblings how are you guys how did you guys manage being there's 11 of you well I think well, from well several there's marriages? there's there's okay in my, I have I have 10 siblings all together but that's between six marriages three marriages on my father's side three marriages on my mother's side and I just happen to be the one uh, that has no full blood siblings everybody else you know everybody else uh, some of them do but for, uh, but for all intents and purposes, it's a, uh, you know, my father was not only a, a great producer, but he was a great reproducer. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. right? Oh my God. So tell us one thing we don't know about Bar Barry Gordy. One okay. thing you don't yeah. know about Barry Gordy. Okay. You don't know that Barry Gordy is responsible for our first black president. Really? Ah, uh, okay. Really? How is that? Okay, here's how I figure it. Okay, ah. we're talking six degrees of separation. Okay. Okay, so the six degrees of separation is Barry Gordy develops this guy by the name of Michael Jackson, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then Mike, and then Barry Gordy does this movie called The Wiz where he hires this guy Quincy Jones to do the music. Right. Michael Jackson and Quincy Jones hook up right and then they decide that they're going to do a record together and that record becomes the biggest record in the world thriller okay so now they have thriller and uh quincy jones is now seen by this guy who's this great producer by the name of steven spielberg and steven spielberg says hey quincy i want you to produce this black movie with me called the color purple so yeah. so so quincy's producing the movie but when quincy is in chicago he sees this woman on this daytime TV show by the name of Oprah Winfrey. And he decides that he's gonna put her in this movie. So he puts her in this movie, and through that popularity, she takes her, her, her television show national. And she decides that she's going to back a candidate by the name of Barack Obama, right? Wow. And there we go. <laughs> There we go. The six degrees. I love it. I My love father it. put the president in office. I love it. <laughs> I'll run with that. That's, That's right. right. That's right. That's right. right. But realistically, yeah. Motown, um, Motown history is different because of the advent of Motown. Prior to Motown, 
blacks and whites, they were se segregated and they were separated. And through, you know, the, the, the music with Diana Ross singing all of these songs and these little white girls could say, wait a minute, she sounds like me, right? <laughs> and it was, it was, and it was, it was classy and it was nice. Everybody kind of gravitated and the, and the, and the separation started, be, started coming together. And through the, you know, the civil rights movement and through the war and through all of this, we started coming together as a people. And so because of all of that, we, the, the United States actually started spreading the love around the world. And now the, is, is, it, it, it really became something special. So I think that um, Motown was uh, very instrumental in kind of pulling that together. And then after Motown, then of course you have Russell Simmons and Puffy, and now Dr. Dre just does a billion dollar deal. Yeah. Th those yeah, things crazy. could not have happened right. without Motown. And by the way, we were the number one um, uh, black owned company in America mm -hmm. or uh, 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 mm -hmm. in America. And uh, it's told to me that at one point, my father was responsible for more black millionaires than anybody else in the world. Mm -hmm. And so. I love that time period and listening to Soul yeah. Train and yeah. dancing, yeah. trying to get my groove on. That's right. No, yeah. it was great. And Dick Clark <laughs> yes. and, and then the movies that, yeah. that, that we were doing and the television specials, it was like, for black people, it was very important because now they had something to look up to. They had something to uh, aspire to be. And so um, I'm so proud that in my, my legacy or uh, my lineage uh, comes from that. I'm, I'm really proud, hmm. really proud. You should be, you should be. So where are you going today? Who are you today? What are you doing? How can people find you? Okay, well, one, one yes. more quick story. A lot of people have said, "Oh, you know, uh, uh, Barry Gordy. He 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 was he was a he was a shark. He he took he, you know he uh, took people's publishing. He did this and he did that." No, see, here's the deal. He was a he was a publisher. His people were writers, right? And so, yes, he's like, okay, listen, if you're going to sign with Motown, we're going to control the publishing because my job is to get your stuff out into the public. My job is to, is to sell your stuff and to make you big. That's what I do. I'm not stealing your publishing. I'm taking the resources that I have available to me to get you onto the top of the charts. And a lot of people will say yes, but he took 100% of the publishing. And I would say, I would say, um, well, you know, uh, uh, James, um, James, uh, I think it's James Washington came to me and he was like, I'm not going to do the deal with you guys because you've taken, you take 100% of the publishing and you guys rip everybody off. And I was like, wait a minute. Um, no, we make you, we make you famous. Um, because if Rick James, Lionel Richie, Stevie Wonder, Michael Jackson, if all of those people felt that way, you would have never heard of them. Right. And now they have the ability to do whatever they want to do. So yes. what I do right now, I'm an intellectual property manager and I focus on copyright recapture. And what I've been doing is for those artists that did give their stuff away. Now, what we do is we go and we get it back for them or we get them paid for it. Oh, OK, that's great. so. For instance, uh, Smokey Robinson is one of my clients. We did, uh, we're, I'm working with uh, some of Marvin Gaye's people right now. We did um, Rick James Estate. We're doing Ashford and Simpson. Um, we're doing all of these, um, all of these things. Uh, the, uh, Whitfield, you heard it through the grapevine and, and, and Ain't Too Proud to Beg and uh, Papa Was a Rolling Stone. You know, these people are now either getting paid or they're getting their copyrights back. So. I feel like Robin Hood. I feel like Robin Hood. I'm Robin Hood. Yes. yes. Um, uh, uh, w w with my clients, and they love me for that. And I almost feel like that's a that's a level of poetic justice. And I feel like um, I was kind of put on earth to do that. I don't know what my calling was, but now I feel like my gosh, I'm able to help the people that help make my family uh, a legacy. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much, Carrie. It's great to be here. So pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Carrie. Yeah. Yeah.